Hey there, hipsters, and welcome to a brand new season of Pick 6 Movies. This is always a great time when we open up the vaults on the six movies we've picked around whatever theme we've decided on. And this season, which we're calling Pop Culture Club, is a season all about movies created when some nonsense bubbled up in pop culture and then some dummy decided to make a movie about it. We're kicking things off with... Oh no. What have we done? We're kicking things off with the Garbage Pail Kids movie. And in typical Pick 6 fashion, we'll have a thoughtful introduction from Chad to fill you in on the backstory, and then I'll be back to talk about the Garbage Pail Kids movie. Ugh. Let's get Chad in here to open the lid on this landfill. God, what what have we done? All right, here we are, season 24, with our new intern... Marathon? Like a race? So it's Mary Mary Thon? I've never met anyone named Mary Thon before. Do people call you Mary or do they call you Mary Thon? Well then I too shall call you Marathon. <laughs> what are you studying in college, Marathon? That brought you to be an intern here at Pick Six Movies. Sports medicine, of course. You ever run a marathon, Marathon? I have run seven marathons in my life. Yeah. And then I wised up and uh, came to my senses. I don't do that anymore. What's your last name? Please tell me it's runner. Page. Marathon Page. You're going to get your doctorate. I would go to a Dr. Marathon Page as my sports medicine professional of choice. Why are you interning at a podcast, Marathon? Minor in communication. And you like the show? Oh, well, Marathon, we're going to get along famously. As a fan of the show, Marathon, you know, this is the time where we lay down some audio and provide an introduction of the movie for the people listening. And then later on, you'll go in and edit it down, make it sound really good so you can get credit for this internship. You can just leave all of this banter in or out. It's up to you. I really don't care. Let me ask you this, Marathon. Do you even know what a garbage pail kid is? (laughs) <laughs> no, no, it is not a discarded abortion. That's a great guess. <laughs> this new season's starting off better than I even thought it would. This is fantastic. You know what? Uh, give me some of that music uh, that we think is suitable for explaining how the subject of this episode isn't a discarded abortion. <laughs> and we'll get this show on the road. And to get this show on the road, we have to go all the way back to the late 1800s. In 1890, the American Leaf Tobacco Company was founded by the Salomon family, where they imported tobacco to the United States and they sold it to other established tobacco companies. During the First World War, the company could not maintain its supplies of Turkish tobacco, and then the Great Depression hit, and then the company found itself in a real pickle. Since they didn't have tobacco to sell to people as a substance that they could stick in their mouth holes to consume, leadership in the company said, hey, What if we sell something else to people that they could stick in their mouth holes? Somebody else in the company said, like what? And that first person said, how about, I don't know, chewing gum. But not just any gum. Our gum is going to be tops when it comes to things you can stick in your mouth. And so was born the Tops Company, a manufacturer of chewing gum. By the 1950s, the company was selling individually wrapped pieces of bazooka chewing gum that was in a piece of paper that had a comic on the inside. A piece of gum and a joke? Yes, please. Now, around this time, trading cards were also sold along with other products, specifically tobacco products and cigarettes. They were like prizes you got when you purchased cancer-causing addictive nicotine delivery systems for your mouth hole. Early cards featured topics on nature or war or sports, and when baseball became a professional sport, trading cards with images of athletes became a focus of these cardboard trinkets that you got along with some of that sweet, sweet Carolina smoke. 
Now, when the American Tobacco Trading Company created the Topps Company to shill their gum, they incorporated trading cards into their business model. Originally, these cards featured stars of Western movies and television. There were also athletes, not only from baseball, but also football. Eventually, this led to the creation of complete trading card sets. Topps took over the trading card industry, buying up all of their competitors. And by the mid-50s into the 80s, they featured cards across multiple areas beyond sports and entertainment. Specifically, they introduced a comedy-themed pack of trading cards called Wacky Pack. Wacky Packages debuted in 1967 and including cards that you could punch out, lick, and stick onto surfaces. The cards featured parodies of known products. For example, Morton Salt was depicted as Moron Salt, and the Jolly Green Giant was the Jolly Mean Giant. <laughs> there were 44 original cards in the set, but 14 were pulled from production due to some cease and desist letters from companies that had lawyers with no sense of humor. Wacky Packages was followed up with Wacky Ads in 1969, which included miniature billboards that you could lick and stick. In this case, there was an ad for Good and Plenties that got goofed on as Good and Empties, and Maxwell House Coffee was tweaked to be Maxwell Hearse Coffee. You get the idea. Wacky Packages returned in 1973 and continued to run through 1977, riding the wave of counterculture driven by underground comic book artists and included mostly inoffensive humor that was the lifeblood of Mad Magazine and Cracked Magazine. Speaking of Mad Magazine, Jay Lynch, one of the guys behind Wacky Packages, well, he went on to work for Mad Magazine. Other underground comic creators worked to create the Wacky Packages, included Tom Sutton, who would help bring the comic book character Vampirella to the hands of eager, horny comic book nerds. Art Spiegelman was instrumental in creating Wacky Packages to help pay the bills years before he would win a Pulitzer Prize for his graphic novel Mouse, which told the story of his father's experience as a Polish Jew during the Holocaust. Wacky Packages was a home for all manner of counterculture underground artists to come in and crank out these trading cards featuring punny takes on established companies and brands to sell along with a stale piece of chewing gum. In all, 488 different cards were produced across 16 series of Wacky Packages through the 1970s and 1980s. Topps was not only selling cards with cringe-worthy punny jabs at the corporate capitalistic system that runs on advertising to make America great. I mentioned that they had sports-themed cards, but musicians also had their own sets of cards, like the Beatles. Politicians, including John F. Kennedy, were featured on cards. There were sci-fi originals, including Mars Attacks, which would later go on to get its own feature film starring just about everybody in Hollywood. Cards were based on Star Wars, Charlie's Angels, Happy Days. If it was popular, it was on a piece of cardboard with a piece of barely ingestible gum wrapped in plastic. But after years of cranking out wacky packages, the creative comedy team had kind of run dry on companies and products to tweak with some good-natured and oftentimes litigious wordplay to sell to preteen boys and girls. They needed to find a new source of inspiration, something that was so popular that it begged to be parodied in similar fashion. And they found their muse in the 1980s doll phenomenon of Cabbage Patch Kids. The popularity of Cabbage Patch Kid dolls in the 1980s is almost impossible to describe. You can go listen to season four, episode three, featuring the Christmas movie Jingle All the Way to hear all about the hysteria behind these fat-faced and at times violently sought after dolls. The creative clowns over at Topps decided to create a series of trading cards featuring parodies of the Cabbage Patch dolls to be called Garbage Pail Kids. The cards would have stickers featuring a doll with some odd physical feature or possibly suffering a terrible fate wrapped around clever punny wordplay. For example, Adam Bomb featured a dimple-faced doll pushing a red button causing his head to explode into a mushroom cloud. Garbage Pail Kids were the brainchild of Art Spiegelman. And I can't wrap my head around the fact that the guy who wrote and illustrated Mouse is the guy behind Garbage Pail Kids. Marathon, have you read Mouse? 
Yeah, a, the school board in Tennessee banned it because it had swear words and uh, nudity and uh, violence and suicide. You know, most of the nudity in question is of anthropomorphic mice. They didn't seem to mind all of the, the Nazi references and genocide, though. Hmm. I'm not sure how the members of the school board could even see those images with their heads so far up their own asses. But it won't be the last time we talk about schools and parents freaking out unnecessarily in this introduction. I guarantee you that. Guts get back to the Garbage Pail Kids. Art Spiegelman, along with Mark Newgarden, were the editors and directors of the Garbage Pail Kids project. And the first run of 44 cards required 44 individual paintings of each Garbage Pail Kid to be produced. These 44 individual paintings were done by one man, John Pound. He completed the task in two months. 44 paintings in 60 days. That meant that Pound was cranking out almost one painting a day for two months straight. <laughs> that is insane. Pound completed the task and they published the cards and holy shit, kids lost their minds. They could not get their hands on Garbage Pail Kids trading cards fast enough. And the real question was, why were they so popular? And really, there were multiple reasons. For starters, they were making fun of the ultra-sweet, totally innocent, insanely popular Cabbage Patch dolls. Next, they were shocking at times to the easily offended. And because of that, parents and school systems hated Garbage Pail Kid trading cards. And the more grown-ups hated them, the more kids loved them and wanted to get their hands on these cards. And they were inexpensive. It was something that kids could buy with what little money they had in their tiny little pockets. Garbage Pail Kids became a national phenomenon. And this was during the heyday of Tipper Gore slapping warning labels on albums that used dirty words. Everybody was trying to save our children from objectionable content. And the Garbage Pail Kid trading cards ultimately were banned across certain school systems, turning them into contraband that only the most rebellious of elementary and middle school kids dare to carry into the classroom. More artists were brought in to help meet the growing demand to create new and disgusting Garbage Pail Kid creations. Moms clutched their pearls as the people at Tops clutched fists of cash as the popularity of these comic cards skyrocketed. Knowing that this popularity wouldn't last forever, they decided that they were going to milk this for all it was worth. The top brass in charge of Saturday morning cartoons over at CBS, they came to the fine folks at Tops and said, <laughs> We like what you're doing here with your goony garys and your smelly Susans and all of that sweet, sweet money you're raking in. Let's make an animated version of the Trash Can Kids or whatever the hell you call these things. We'll put it on TV, sell ads, and we'll make lots and lots of money. Plus, I know the boys over at DC, they want to make a funny book of these disgusting little rascals. What do you say? Let's get rich, boys. And so an animated series was produced and it was terrible. So bad that it was never aired on TV. The creative team behind the Garbage Pail Kids were so happy the show never made it to air based on just watching the pilot. Primarily because to make the show palatable for Saturday morning cartoon audiences, you know, little kids, they had to remove all of the nastiness and disgusting weirdness that made Garbage Pail Kids so popular. But luckily, there was another plan to bring the delightfully disgusting delinquent drivers to life by way of a feature film. As the popularity of Garbage Pail Kids grew, talk started around making a feature film. Inner veteran television and film producer slash director Rod Amateo. Amateo started his career as a dialect coach in the early 1950s, and he worked his way up to producing and directing film and television. He worked on the George Burns and Gracie Allen show in the 50s. He was a producer and director on The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis. He worked on Gilligan's Island, My Mother the Car, which was a sitcom about a guy whose mother is reincarnated as the family car. He was a supervising producer and at times director on The Dukes of Hazard and its spinoff, Enos, in the 80s. Following that, he adapted the Kenny Rogers stock car racing movie Six Pack 
to a TV show starring a young Don Johnson and Marky Post. That failed. And after that, Amateo, at the age of 64, he needed to continue to work to fund his retirement pension according to the Director's Guild policies, which is what brought him to the Garbage Pail Kids movie. Now, it's not clear exactly who helped to pull all of the pieces together that delivered unto the world the Garbage Pail Kids movie, due mostly to the fact that nobody is willing to go on record to take responsibility for what was ultimately produced. Amateo assumed that the project would never go to theaters and instead would end up as a made-for-TV movie. He enlisted the help of Linda Palmer, who is credited as Melinda Palmer. <laughs> I get it. You want some plausible deniability here, Linda? Or Melinda? You choose. Uh, I'm easy. <laughs> Linda or Melinda. She'd previously written two episodes of the TV drama series Family and... That is it. Oh boy. Reportedly, the story of the movie was written by Bill Tennant, who is in charge of the film's distribution company. Amateo said that Tennant's story was delivered on a single sheet of paper. Amateo and Linda Melinda turned it into a screenplay, and 60 days after Amateo's initial meeting about working on the movie, cameras were rolling. None of the creatives behind the Garbage Pail Kids trading cards were involved with the film at all. Not not that they didn't want to be involved, they did, but the team at Tops wanted them to stay focused on the next series of trading cards. Once the licensing deal was done for the team making the movie, all quality control stopped. <laughs> I'll wait till Bo gets here. You'll understand that a whole lot more. The team behind the movie didn't have the time or budget to make the movie that they really wanted to make. It was conceived possibly as being an animated film or maybe a hybrid film with actors and animated characters like Mary Poppins or Who Framed Roger rabbit, but that was not going to happen. So to create the Garbage Pail Kids, Amateo said in an interview, quote, we did the economical expedient. We got dwarves. There are plenty of them. And we got dwarves and we put heads on them. And then we found out how long they could survive in there without breathing. It turned out to be around five, seven minutes. So you had to rehearse everything without the heads on, then put the heads on. And we had a paramedic with a stopwatch. Little sons of bitches go in there and you say, action, you shoot until they can't breathe. End quote. Oh my God. The actors in the costumes were fitted with these oversized heads that had animatronic facial features that were controlled by a team off camera. The heads not only cut off the actors' oxygen supply, it also gave them limited visibility, causing them to often miss their marks and crash into one another during filming. <laughs> Plus, they couldn't hear the other actors' dialogue due to the machinery controlling the puppetry of their faces whirring all around them. The film starred British actor Anthony Newley, who worked in television for years, playing the young lead of the film was Mackenzie Aston, the son of John Aston, the guy who played Gomez Adams on The Adams Family. Mackenzie Aston was a regular on the TV series The Facts of Life when he was cast to play Dodger in the Garbage Pail Kids movie. The film was shot on a soundstage that had almost no air conditioning. The metal roofs mess with the radio controls of these robotic heads, which sometimes caused the animatronic faces to go all screwy. And there was only one head made for each Garbage Pail Kid, which meant that any damage had to be filled in with paint or plaster or gum or who knows what else production would get shut down. <laughs> the movie cost about a million bucks to make, and in its opening weekend, it pulled in a little over $600,000. The total box office haul was around one and a half million bucks. The movie was released in just 374 theaters, and it came in 16th place based on box office revenue rankings, right behind Full Metal Jacket, which was in its ninth week of release, and just ahead of The Monster Squad in its second week. Opening that same weekend was Cheech Marin in Born in East L.A. and Dirty Dancing. 
Want to guess which one of those two made more money? <laughs> it was Cheech Marin and Born in East L.A. I guess somebody can't put baby in the corner. Critics and audiences at the time had nothing good to say about the Garbage Pail Kids movie. It's currently sitting at a 0% <laughs> freshness rating on Rotten Tomatoes. But over on Amazon, the movie has a 4.6 star rating out of 5 stars. Let's, uh, let's, <laughs> let's see what some of these positive polys have to say about the movie. Okay, here's one from Daniel West. Daniel says, after suffering a serious head injury, I really warmed up to this forgotten gym. I like hot dogs. Five stars. Five stars from a guy who likes hot dogs. Well, maybe all those uppity snobs over at Rotten Tomatoes, they got, uh, they got it wrong when it comes to this movie, but they didn't. As the movie slowly faded into obscurity, the Garbage Pail Kids franchise faced other challenges. Lawyers working for the Cabbage Patch Dolls showed up and said, hey, Here's a lawsuit for trademark infringement. Tops, not wanting to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Cabbage Patch Empire, agreed to change up the appearance of their logo for Garbage Pail Kids, and they also agreed to change up the way that the Garbage Pail Kids look by giving them one less finger, and they made their faces look less cloth-like. Sure, nobody's going to confuse Garbage Pail Kids with Cabbage Patch dolls now. <laughs> Money exchanged hands, and the lawyers went away. Following that, the Garbage Pail Kid trading card phenomena slowly faded in popularity, but Topps kept cranking them out during milestone anniversaries with all new cards. They released a book uh, with the original series being featured. There were 3D cards. There were metallic chromium cards. There was a 35th anniversary blockchain series, whatever the hell that means. Anything to make a buck. Isn't that right, Topps? There were rumors in 2012 that Michael Eisner's film production company wanted to make a Garbage Pail Kids movie using computer animation. There are also rumors that HBO may be making a TV series in partnership with Danny McBride's production company. Does anybody really want to see any of this? I mean, I've watched this original movie twice, and I don't want to watch any remakes based on anything around the Garbage Pail Kids, but that's just me. Uh, but maybe my co-host, Mr. Bo Ransel, has a different opinion. So let's not waste any more time and get him in here to discuss this movie to see if it's any good. I can answer that now. It is not. Not. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, slain Waynes and cut up Carmens, we proudly present to you the first episode of Season 24 Themes Pop Culture Club, the regrettable cult classic from 1987, The Garbage Pale Kids Movie. Your name isn't really Marathon, is it? I just realized that. <laughs> What's your name? It's just Mary Page. Hmm. I think this is going to be the start of a beautiful friendship, Mary. <laughs> Trumpet guy, do your thing. And welcome to Pick 6 Movies. I'm Chad Cooper, and I'm joined, as always, by the man who always turns trash into treasure, Mr. Bo Ransdell. Bo, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing fantastic. I, I, I'm beset by uh, a, a feeling of joy mm -hmm. and a feeling that we can do anything, Chad, yes. if we do it together. That's absolutely true, including talk about this, <laughs> this movie. Look, I'm going to start off with a question. And the question uh, is not, is this the worst movie we've ever seen? Because okay, okay. that is subjective and it depends on how you're defining worst. Okay. But does this movie have the lowest production quality of any movie that we've ever discussed on this podcast? You know, I was thinking a lot about House of the Dead watching this movie uh -huh. and, and whether that was... <laughs> Stay Away Joe with Elvis Presley. That was pretty cheap. I mean, that had Elvis who has like char charisma and charm. <laughs> Not about production. Not about production. Value. Yeah, but, but you're still like, you know, the above the line cast yeah. still matters. You're right. It's Pat. Yeah, but even that felt like somebody cared a little bit more. You did see the inside of a vagina. Yeah. So they did something, at least they tried. Right. There were people thinking about that script, and especially like the Dave Foley character. And this is not to suggest in any way, shape, or form that It's Pat is a good movie. No. Far from it. It's just better than the Garbage Pail Kids movie. This movie is shocking. 
in the number of strange choices made by the filmmakers. It is so grounded in laziness and just inept filmmaking. It reminded me of like looking at a children's highlights magazine where there's the what's wrong with this picture and you're just like that kid has shoes on his hands and gloves on his feet. That's what this movie was like. And I don't mean just a terrible script and characters and just everything about it is just rotten and decaying and just absent of any caring whatsoever well you know in keeping with the theme of the season it feels like a cash grab and not only a cash grab but one that no one cared about here's the thing on rotten tomatoes it has like a zero percent critic rating Mm -hmm. but it's got like a 27 percent or so audience approval rating i quoted the bonked on the head hot dog guy in the (laughs) intro but if you really go through and read a lot of the reviews on amazon the people who bought this movie there are a lot of very positive reviews and they're all rooted in nostalgia and ignorance (laughs) (laughs) yeah but that's the thing that kind of blows my mind is that anyone like even if you saw this as a kid going back to it or even just thinking back on it how does it live well in the memory like this is a movie i'm actively seeking movies to watch to help me forget that i ever saw this hey hey man let me tell you when i when i was a kid i remember watching the garbage trash kid movie with my dad (laughs) and and i remember watching that movie and thinking he ain't hitting me right now he ain't hitting me what going to the theater and seeing the garbage pail kids movie was the first time my daddy ever gave me a sip of his old granddad. And I've been drinking that every day since. I drink a bottle every time I visit him at the penitentiary. You know, on his birthday in Eastern, I drink a bottle on the way home to think about the, the trash garbage kids movie. We sing a little song together while I'm drunk on one side and he's drunk on raisin wine on the other. And we we sing, we can drink anything if we drink it together. Uh, and just like old nerdy Nat, we piss ourselves. <laughs> Let's get into this. this. Here's another question I have for you both. <laughs> yes, please. I wonder what it would be like to show this movie to someone who has no idea <laughs> what the garbage pail kids are. Like right. a functioning normal human being, like someone who has a job and pays taxes and doesn't do felonious activities, just like a, a normal human being. Like, hey, do you like movies? Of course I do. Watch this. Like, what the hell would they make of this? <laughs> On the other side of it, they would probably be like, I don't like movies anymore. <laughs> and, I, and I don't like you. If this is what movies can lead to, <laughs> then maybe we should stop doing it. What if What if this happened again, Chad? So this movie starts off with the MGM Roaring Lion, followed by the Atlantic Releasing Corporation logo. Mm-hmm. They were the company that put out Valley Girl and Teen Wolf after Michael J. Fox became a big star in Back to the Future. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they made Teen Wolf 2. We need to give that one a test drive. And not surprisingly, Bo, they made a movie based on the Masters of the Universe and released that. Well, that sounds interesting. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, after these two production logos, the movie starts, and it begins with some text that says, A Tops Chewing Gum Production. <laughs> Yeah. I was like, look, at least McDonald's had the decency to hide behind a shell corporation company when they made Mac and me. But Tops is like, hey, man, this is my baby. I can't deny it. <laughs> also, this movie is as good as Tops chewing gum. That dry ass crack chewing gum. Maybe if I suck on it with a little bit of spit, it'll taste better. Nope, it doesn't. Yeah, it feels like it needs to be rehydrated, like that Back to the Future 2 machine. (laughs) You'd have a better chance of just eating the card that came with it than chewing the gum. Yeah, it's better for you. The movie's title logo comes up, The Garbage Pail Kids Movie, and it's floating in the black expanse of star-filled outer space, Mm Bo. And then it's followed by the emergence 
emergence of a floating Garbage Pail Kids collector card. And it's highlighting the actors in the movie and the characters that they're going to play. Clever way to introduce the movie. I'm on board with it. And these cards feature the signature look of the Garbage Pail Kids trading cards with the font treatments and the whole layout. Now, top billing, Bo, goes to Anthony Newley, who is playing Cap'n Manzini, spelled mm-hmm. C-A-P apostrophe N, like Cap'n Crunch. I didn't talk about Anthony Newley a whole lot in the introduction, other than to mention that he had a pretty lengthy trail of work in television and the film, but he was a real deal songwriter. Newley won the 1963 Grammy Award Song of the Year for What Kind of Fool Am I? That was sung by Sammy Davis Jr. And he also wrote the song Feeling Good, which became a signature hit for Nina Simone. Yeah, terrific song, yeah. Yeah, great song. And he was nominated for an Academy Award for the score of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, where he wrote Pure Imagination. And he teamed up with John Barry to write the song Goldfinger for the James Bond film Goldfinger. (laughs) He's like a, but he was a real talented guy. When you yeah. watch this movie, it helps to explain why he's constantly just sitting at a tiny piano, arguably a little bit drunk, just taking out songs left and right. He is easily the best thing about this movie. Yes. In the sense that he cares, he's trying to put in a performance, he's bringing some level of energy to the movie. He doesn't come out clean. Like nobody gets away from this one. Uh uh-uh. uh. But he is doing the best with what he can. Mm -hmm. It's like the most edible part of the shit are the corn niblets. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That there's some level of nutrition and color. So the second card that comes up in outer space features Mackenzie Austin as a character named Dodger. Although Mm -hmm. they only call him Dodger I think two or three times in this whole movie. And the first time I watched it, I got a little confused as to who they were talking about. (laughs) I also noted in the intro for him that he was on the show, The Facts of Life, but he showed up after Mrs. Garrett left the boarding school to go run that little country store. And like all the girls who had aged out of the school decided to, you know, go live with her. Mm -hmm. Our third card that comes up features Katie Barbary as Tangerine. Now, upon initial viewing i thought that this character was going to be a prostitute because she's wearing this red bustier and she's got signature 80s hair and a pink glove on one hand but it turns out the tangerine isn't giving out handies for 10 bucks a pop uh she's a bipolar fashion designer Bo, we're gonna really get into her <laughs> character a lot if you've seen pretty woman or showgirls yeah she looks a lot <laughs> like the julia roberts like that kind of mini skirt outfit she wears with the thigh high boots and pretty woman there's a lot of suddenly seeking susan and it certainly feels reflective of the time in which it was made it's also worth noting that mckenzie austin the guy who plays dodger Mm -hmm. and uh katie barbary tangerine they started dating a few months before this movie began production and he was the one who recommended her for the part oh (laughs) boy during the filming of the movie they broke up sure in this film she looks like she's about 12 years older than him she's a good six to eight inches taller yeah 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 like she hit the growth spurt before he did for sure yeah like her presence in this movie and his attraction to her makes this one of the top 10 horniest movies i think we've ever watched for this which is strange because it's a kid's movie yeah he gets a lot of boners in it there is one moment (laughs) they might as well have had a sprung sound but we'll get to that So after these three cards of our three principal players, you're like, hey, you know, we haven't seen any Garbage Pail Kids. Now some cards start coming up showing Garbage Pail Kids that are going to be in our movie. But they don't mention the actors playing these characters, which is a real slight against the talented and tortured performers who jumped around in these costumes. So the first card that comes up is Valerie Vomit, who is a black girl, and she's wearing a blue dress with a white apron. And her character is vomiting into a saute pan that's on a stove with fire licking the bottom of the pan, implying that she is going to serve this reheated vomit to someone else or possibly reconsume it herself. Yes. Also, Valerie Vomit only vomits once in this entire movie. Well, traditional (laughs) vomit. She throws up a playing card 
But that looks more like a magic trick. In fairness, she does vomit on two people. Yes. So that's, you know, something, I guess. There's a lot of bodily fluids. In fact, I think all of the bodily fluids are in this movie. Yeah, and bodily functions, just in general. It's all there. All right. So after Valerie vomit on her card, next we get Wendy Winston, who is black and he's a guy. He's hunkered down, just ripping a fart that is blowing out the back of his blue jeans with a mist shaped musical note in this cloud of ass gas behind it. And for what it's worth, Wendy Winston farts a lot in this movie. Mm hmm. And again, these Garbage Pail Kid cards, these are the original cards that have been redone because of the lawsuit with Cabbage Patch Kids. So they look a little different, but it's just the characters. So the next up is Foul Phil, who Mm -hmm. is a baby in an overall onesie. And Foul Phil has green gas wafting out of his mouth with a flower pot nearby. And there's a dead daisy wilted over, one assumes, from the smell of his bad breath. And Foul Phil in our movie does jack shit in this movie. Right. Creepily asks a few people if they are his mommy and then breathes at a couple of people. But yeah, it, like you could totally remove that character and nothing about this movie changes. Of our seven Garbage Pail Kids, Foul Phil is worthless. They're all pretty worthless, but he's the worst of the worst. After introducing three Garbage Pail Kids, the movie stops introducing cards. And you're like, wait, is that all the Garbage Pail Kids in our movie? But then the film introduces Planet Earth in the background as a giant trash can flies into frame with three glowing engines powering the rear of the trash can. And you're like, wait, so the Garbage Pail Kids came from outer space? Right. This is a real question of this movie is where did they come from? I mean, is is it magic? Is it from outer space? (laughs) Is it outer space magic? And and the answer is, uh oh. Before we focus too much on the space trash can, again, Mm -hmm. which has nothing to do with anything in this movie, we get another introductory card for Nat Nerd. Now, Nat Nerd is this fat white kid, and he's wearing this ill-fitting baby blue tracksuit. Perhaps his underwear might be on the outside of this, and he's wearing a superhero red cape. His big belly is sticking out from under his shirt, and the shirt has a red lightning bolt on it, and the letters GPK. <laughs> and beside him is a box that appears to be for storing comic books. And in each hand, he's holding like multiple comic books. So Nat Nerd, he's also wearing glasses and he looks a lot like Josh Gad. Yes. <laughs> Now, you would think, Bo, that Nat Nerd's defining characteristic would be his vast knowledge of comic books and superheroes, quite possibly a minor in Dungeons and Dragons, Mm -hmm. to the point of, you know, him talking about it would just be annoying. But no, Nat Nerd, his signature move is just pissing himself. (laughs) Yeah, which also uh, led to me questioning that, because I think you're right. Like, he should just be the know-it-all that everyone's like, shut up, Nat. Instead, he just has, like, all these hives and pisses himself. He's like a perpetually frightened chihuahua with the bladder of a great day. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like, I, I don't think that Nat Nerd was ever introduced to the concept of indoor plumbing. It was like one day he just outgrew diapers and nobody explained to him how the world works. Right. Like, he's just not housebroken. Like, you know, they need to give him a treat every time he goes to the bathroom <laughs> in the potty. So up next is Ali Gator. Now, unlike his fellow Garbage Pail Kids, Ali Gator has the head of an alligator, so he's not human like the others. He mm-hmm. does have this Don King-inspired hair, and he wears a loud Hawaiian shirt. And on his card, he's holding a fish in each hand, although he doesn't eat fish in the movie. Instead, he eats human eyeballs and... And has a foot fetish. Yes. <laughs> right. He, he is a consumer of human beings. You know, he's got his preferred pieces. Yes. But yes, it is just him eating people. So moving on, we get a card for Greaser Greg. He's this 50s era bad boy with a mm. leather jacket and a t-shirt with a skull and like crossbones made out of wrenches. And Greg's holding a switchblade in one hand and like this three foot length of chain in the other, <laughs> like suitable for beating people. And Greaser Greg also has a broken bottle behind him, but it's not the top part you stab people with. It's the bottom half. I don't know what that's for. I'm not sure I really want to find out. <laughs> and then the movie brings 
throws our spaceship trash can back into frame. Wait, what's that? Oh, never mind. It's gone. <laughs> we get a card for Messy Tessie, who has an excessive amount of snot pouring from her nose onto her hands. It's all stretched out like taffy, like from both palms to her cheeks and down to her feet. That also does not translate well to the film. No. In the movie version of this character, yes, there is a little mucus, but it's no more than you would see on like a messy four-year-old. All right. Are you there? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. I This is a laptop I use for teaching and I take my cord with me to class as well. So normally I just reach over and plug it up. Okay. So da 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 All right. Okay. I'm breaking Ready? And that's everybody who's anybody in our movie that deserves a flying card introduction. So here our movie fades out and we fade back in on the city street of a soundstage. It looks like Sesame Street after dark. (laughs) (laughs) Right, like Sesame Street fell on hard times. Oh, yeah. It's it's suitable for a nice uh, Mushnick's flower shop to move in any day. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yeah, like this is... The area that Oscar lives in, uh-huh. that all the other characters come and visit, <laughs> but they don't live there, you know? <laughs> so, hey, so, why don't you... Hey, there's an apartment opening up. No thanks, Oscar. <laughs> Are you come sure? On. It'd be real convenient. You could <laughs> come over for dinner some night in my trash can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We get it. But no. <laughs> so, thanks, but no thanks, Oscar. They removed the bodies. And cleaned up most of the blood. I <laughs> love trash. It's all the methadone you want. They just throw them right in here. Remember when Homer saw that guy sleeping in the dumpster? He said, he just like Oscar the Grinch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad that I grew up in a world where the Simpsons were around. Um, so we see a couple of uncredited extras walking by quickly trying to get out of this sketchy neighborhood before they get stabbed and chunked into the the <laughs> the haunted apartment that no one ever wants to rent near Oscar's trash can. And uh we zoom into a window um that hold on da, 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 da. okay so so we we head down into this window and uh inside of it we see a trash can. It's not Oscar's trash can. It's a different mm-hmm. trash can. And it's wiggling under its own power. Then it starts to spit out green ooze that just looks like moldy applesauce. And then objects in this store that we see as an antique store based on the writing on the front window paint, they just start moving about on their own. There's this Anibus head that turns. A painting with the eyes cut out has deep set eyes and the eyeballs are peeking around like a Scooby-Doo episode. Lights are flickering. There's an office chair that turns on its own. And then this trash can that we see makes you wonder, hey, is that the trash can from space? Mm -hmm. Because you would think it would be, but we don't know, Bo. That space trash can is never mentioned again with its rocket power. No, it it does not come up at the end. Like, we don't see them all hopping in their spaceship trash can and flying away, which is how I thought the movie was going to end. Yeah. The first time I watched it, but... Of course. Or that space trash can would come down with other garbage pail kids and collect them up like E.T. or something. None of that. Right. Which begs the question. This goes back to where we started. This movie is so plagued with just bad decisions. Don't show the space trash can just show the cards and then you come in and we've got ooey gooey gross garbage pail kids they didn't do that we do see little flittering around like there's a hand reaching up for a taxidermied alligator it's all this little mayhem that's happening and we see little feet running around and one voice is like turn out the lights i can't see we gotta get out of this place if it's the last thing we ever do it's a better life for me and you and then there's one, there's some little overall legs and a shoe, and you're like, is that Chucky? Oh, what I wouldn't give the, for a Chucky in this movie. To just start stabbing them all and doing <laughs> bad puns. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah, exactly. And then Captain Manzini, he comes up from the basement, and then all of these mischievous mischief makers, they all run and hop back in the trash can. Well, excuse me, the garbage pail. Yeah, right. <laughs> and yeah, and so he is like, Well, I think that's just about enough of all of you. And puts this like old school 20,000 leagues under the sea diving 
helmet on top of the trash can, uh-huh. which I assume is meant to keep all the garbage bail kits in line. Then we cut from that nighttime spookorama to uh the star question mark of our movie mackenzie aston yeah. being chased through the park by some hoods dodger who we should say is 14 years old he tells us this a little bit later yes and he is being pursued Bo, by adults adults Bo, people that are in their mid to late 20s these people have 10 years on him at least and dodger is hauling ass through this park but he keeps looking over his shoulder to see if they're catching up with him a helpful hint if people are chasing you like really chasing you just run as fast as you fucking can don't look back to see if they're still after you You just run you dummy <laughs> yeah. yeah you'll know if they're if they've caught up to you well, there's a few people t- chasing Dodger. One of them's a guy named Wally, who's always dressed like he just left a rave as the sun was coming up. Mm-hmm. And then there's a woman named Blythe, who looks like she's on her way to audition for an amateur woman's wrestling league that's really a front for punishment porn. I was going to say, uh, <laughs> like a, a, a musical production of The Road Warrior. <laughs> I think that that's that suitable as well. It should be noted the actor who plays Wally in this was the son of the guy who directed the film. Oh, all right. Well, that makes some sense. Yeah, so (laughs) we probably didn't have to pay him. So Wally and Blythe, two names that strike fear into any 14-year-old boy, Mm Bo, they uh, chase Dodger into the arms of our main bad guy, and his name is Juice. And Juice is a white guy, and he looks like every low-level drug dealer on a less-than episode of Miami Vice. He's wearing these slip-on shoes and no socks he has these linen pants he's got a sky blue wife beater that's covered up by a bold blazer and he's got these cheap sunglasses and an ever-present cigarette perched on his lips and next to him is tangerine she's our uh our main female character remember she got a card at the beginning mm-hmm. and uh but she's a crazy person yeah tangerine is like psychologically unwell yes I think she's suffered a lot of trauma in her life. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she's messed up. There is so much underlying, like something happened with a relative, you know, a male relative in particular because of the way that she is equal parts manipulative and needy. She's got some stuff going on. Yeah. Juice says to Dodger after they catch our main kid, he goes, give me the money, creep. And Dodger says, oh, I don't have any money. I'm just a 14-year-old kid. Juice then commands Wally to manhandle Dodger, drag this kid over to this little bridge that's like eight inches off the ground with a dugout puddle below created just for this scene. And in this shot, it should be noted that off in the background, there are random onlookers that were just in the park that day watching this production. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Surprise, surprise. And you can Uh, tell because their heads are cocked and they're just like, what are they doing over there? What is happening to that poor young boy? Wally just goes full Suge Knight, grabs Dodger by the ankles, turns him upside down, and then Juice reaches into Dodger's back pocket and pulls up a stack of folded money, which I was like, why did you need to flip him upside down? It seems like that makes it more difficult to fish the money out of his pocket, but don't ask me. And then Wally just drops Dodger in this mud puddle that they made for this scene. Then Wally kicks this kid in the stomach, leaving Dodger covered in mud and possibly some inter internal bleeding yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) dump him right in a puddle and tangerine is hanging all over juice like because apparently they are an item or she knows if she doesn't he's gonna punch her we see that later he gets real violent with her yeah yeah and worth saying that Blythe at one point uh tangerine is like get a load of these guys beating up this four-year-old Blythe's like yeah this is amazing what are, to to quote her chad she says i love psychos it's never explained how juice and his thugs know dodger and it, it's never explained why they are targeting dodger they don't explain why dodger had all of this money in his pocket mm-hmm. <laughs> dodger i'm guessing is walking home or wherever he sleeps we never really find that out but on his way he stops and stares into the window of manzini's antiques cap manzini he walks up beside dodger outside the store and he goes good lord you smell like a fire hydrant 
And I was like, "What does that mean? He smells like dog piss? Exactly my notes. What does that mean? <laughs> that, like a fresh coat of paint? Dog pee? Uh, <laughs> That's like if I said, like, you have the lazy bowels of the Dutch. Like, what? The, the are Do they eat too much red meat? What? I don't understand. Dodger looks up at Captain Manzini and he says, oh, I had an accident. And Captain Manzini says, come boy. And he gives a wave of his hand to follow him inside the antique store. And I immediately was thinking, does this kid know this dude? Uh, right. It takes some exposition that's clunkily dropped here in a minute where Anthony <laughs> Newley is like, listen, my good man, you've been working for me for how long? And Two months, sir. Yeah. He's like, look, there's only one thing I've ever forbidden you not to touch in this store. And is, is that penis? garbage pail? No, not my penis. You know, you're welcome to that anytime. That's uh, what we call a, a Greek handshake. But uh, so Anthony Newley tries to clean him up a little bit because he smells like a fire hydrant after all. And is like, look, I've got this exotic robe for you. It's called a dashiki. It looks like a dress. It's a dashiki. Also, put on this wig. Take off all of your clothes and put on this woman's dress made for a man. <laughs> all and right. Also, these heels. That's also uh, culturally <laughs> significant in the uh, the place I stole it from. And then he asks uh, Mackenzie Aston, Dodger. He's like... Listen, did you get that Eye of Newton unicorn horn uh, that I asked you for? And he's like, uh, no, sir, because those things are mythological and don't exist. And he's like, ah, well, that's why there's no magic left in the world anymore, because it's all made up, I guess. Manzini does tell him that the, this woman's dress made for a man. I got it from a manly man in Africa. It was given to me by the leader of the Datututut. For making his mother-in-law disappear. And I'm like, okay, so Cap Manzini is a world traveler uh -huh. and possibly a murderer for hire. Yeah, <laughs> uh, po very, very possibly. Also, this movie, not above a mother-in-law joke in the first 10 minutes. Well, we're going to get a lot of fart and vomit and piss, so y you work your way up to that. Good Lord. Dodger says, look, uh, I got in a fight and I lost. And Cap Manzini says, well, losing is relative. What matters is conceding with grace. And then Captain Manzini puts Dodger's dirty clothes into this old-timey washing machine. And then Manzini wiggles his fingers and gives it a little of the old inka dinka do. Uh -huh. And this washing machine just starts to operate by itself like he's a fairy godmother. And I'm like, wait, so this movie has magic in it? Oh, 100%. But he doesn't use magic anymore in the movie. He does it for laundry, and that's it. He kind of does. Like, we'll get to it. Um, but while he, they're they're talking about this, though, Anthony Newley is like, "Listen, my good man, why uh, why don't you report this to the the bobbies around the corner or something?" And uh, and Dodger is like, "No, sir. If I do that, the last time somebody reported." Juice to the police, they ended up pouring concrete on the bypass. And you're like, wait, so Juice is a murderer? Is this children's <laughs> movie dealing with a guy who has committed first degree murder? This seems like a bridge too far. Well, later in the movie, he's either trafficking drugs or human beings. Yeah, 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 yeah. The <laughs> this movie is so wildly inappropriate for its target audience. I mean, it's not good for anybody, know? but well, yeah. I mean, but you would assume if you're making a movie called the Garbage Kid, Pale Kids movie that you want kids from like what ten to fourteen, unless it's the Garbage Pale Kids movie rated R, and then you've got my attention. <laughs> Toby Hooper's The Garbage Pail. Oh, Kids. dude! Now we're wow. talking. Now I'm interested. Toby Hooper's <laughs> Garbage Pail Kids movie is going to involve somebody getting eaten by alligator. You are going to see that like happen. <laughs> You're going to see an actual alligator man eat a foot. <laughs> Valerie Vomit is going to puke on a guy while she's fucking him. Uh, Captain Manzini says to Dodger, he says, Have you ever heard the story of Pandora's box? Pandora was a girl and she opened a box full of trouble. That's what this garbage pail is. It's full of trouble. Here, I'm going to easily lift this garbage pail and put it up on this top of this shelf where it will sit precariously in a very unsafe fashion. Cut to the next day. 
Uh huh. Or whenever. And we see Tangerine and two of her female friends. They come by and they stare in the front window of this antique shop. And Dodger heads over to creep on them because um, he thinks Tangerine, who's easily five to seven years older than him, uh-huh. minimum. But he is peeping on her constantly in this movie. Well, she lives next door, Bo. <laughs> that doesn't mean that you should be staring through her window, which is what he's doing at all hours of the day and night. You're right. And she kind of has that 1980s era high school boys dream goddess look to her. And Tangerine looks up and sees Dodger scoping on her and she kind of rolls her rolls her eyes. Remember the last time she saw Dodger, um, her boyfriend was stealing all of his money and having uh, his muscle Wally throw him in a mud puddle and kick him in the ribs. So Dodger lures Tangerine inside the antique store because, and I quote, we got a lot of stuff for your creations. And I was like, why would Dodger call Tangerine? Tangerine's work creations because later we find out she's a fashion designer uh-huh. why not have dodger say we have lots of stuff that you can use for your fashion designs like creations makes it sounds like she's doing some welding or reanimation of corpses and what he is enticing her inside with chad is a bowl of buttons yeah like he's a squirrel <laughs> and then some brooch that like cuts him as he's showing it to her and she's like Jeez, why don't you just open a vein? Yeah. She's like, you know what? To get out of here, I'll just take this, okay? And then he he takes his hand and wraps her fingers around this little brooch as if to say, like, just take it. It's yours. Not to hit reverse on this, but before (laughs) he hands her this thing and, like, closes her hand on it, there's a moment where he's like, hey, would you like to look at some beads? (laughs) <laughs> and pulls out like this string of beads. And while she's bending down to look at it, he just leans in and smells her hair. Yeah. And you're like, yeah. oh, what is going on with this movie? When I think about people smelling other people, I first think of Joe Biden. Sure. But a close second to that is Winona Ryder's character in Mermaids, where she gets a good sniff of Jake from 16 Candles. And it's done in a way... It's a little bit creepy, but it's it's kind of endearing and says a lot about her character. In this movie, it's more Joe Biden than it is Winona Ryder. Maybe it's different when a woman does it than a guy. I think what what was the uh the movie with Patricia Arquette where the guy kept wanting to smell her armpits? Was that the David O. Russell movie? Yeah, it was. Um, Flirting with Disaster. Yes, Flirting with Disaster is the movie. But yeah, so that's what I was thinking of. That's a good movie. It he is. He was a pretty good filmmaker, but then remember he got all weird when he was screaming and yelling at Lily Tomlin and Dustin Hoffman. Yeah, and I Heart Huckabees. Not a very good movie. Not great, but it's, you know, you it's when you get high on your own supply, right? Like I guess so. <laughs> like everybody was telling him he was a genius and he was like, maybe I'm a genius. <laughs> maybe everybody should listen to what i say uh but (laughs) so anyway but some juice and his boys show up and there is this exceedingly poorly choreographed (laughs) scene (laughs) with dodger Uh slipping under their legs and throwing basketballs at them and this came out a year or two after back to the future the original they're trying to do what they did in back to the future with him getting away from the bad guys in a very clever fashion with the skateboards and all this like when we get to the insane asylum at the end which by the way folks there's an insane asylum at the end (laughs) yeah yeah the state home for the ugly technically but yes there's a whole lot of that lightning and thunder that feels a hell of a lot like the finale of back to the future unnecessarily it, right it means nothing in the movie other than to be like <laughs> hey why is it suddenly storming did the sound stage get a leak uh but anyway so there in this ruckus though that dodger is dodging i guess uh, as per his namesake around all these thugs the titular garbage pail topples over and then that green ooze that we saw starts to leak out of the thing but juice and the thugs don't notice this they're too busy grabbing dodger finally yeah grabbing these adults are grabbing a 14 year old boy yeah and throw him down a sewer then follow him down into the sewer when wally goes down which by the way wally is wearing this really tight mesh shirt and he's got tight pants to match and he goes down in the sewer and dodger looks up at him and he's like what are you gonna do 
And I was like, dude, is is he about to get sexually assaulted? I thought they were going to do a Jason Takes Manhattan on him and just open up the toxic waste valve. I thought they were going to look over and see a pinball machine in the corner and go the accused route. I was like, oh, Lord. <laughs> right. All of a sudden, Dodger is wearing a short denim skirt. I wouldn't be surprised considering what he sports during the back half of this movie. But he's down in the sewer. Uh And when he's down there, behind him are all of these pipes that have words on them. And the words read city zoo, dog pound, Mm -hmm. men's room, toxic waste, implying that these tubes are sources of filth and disposable material. But then some of the other tubes say primetime TV, IRS, CIA, and hot tub, mm-hmm. which is more confusing than it is informative or funny, a theme that runs throughout this movie. <laughs> right. A lot of ideas being thrown at the wall and none of them stick. <laughs> no. So then Juice and Blythe, they come down and then Tangerine comes down the sewer. The whole gang's in the sewer. And then Juice and Wally try to turn a valve on one of the pipes, but they're too weak. So Blythe is like, out of the way, boys. And she steps in and cranks this valve. Once she turns it, Bo, straight up raw sewage, shit and piss pour out all over this 14-year-old boy as our movie's bad guys escape, replacing the manhole cover. Yeah, so they they open that zoo water valve and it's just assumedly zoo pee and poop. Is what's coming out of this? Or is it zoo it, drinking it might water? It be human piss and shit. We don't know. Yeah. Again, it's, it, it could be from the dog pound. It could be from the men's room. We don't know. It's straight up shit and piss because after they leave Dodger and they replace the manhole cover, inexplicably, Bo, our mysterious garbage pail kids are also in the sewer and we hear them say... Turn off the waters, guys. He don't look so good. And then we cut to Dodger laying on the ground, Bo, with literal chunks of shit (laughs) on his face. Uh And his mouth is open. So you know some of that pee and poo-poo water went in his mouth and his nose and his ears and his eyes. How this kid isn't the first case of permanent pink eye recorded in the annals of medical history is a real shocker to me we only get like four or five days worth of you know actual movie time here he is dead within a month you don't live through that this is the last thing he did before his body like the kidney started failing one of his eyes just fell out alligator probably ate that (laughs) we get to dodger and he's sitting in a chair and he's being cleaned up and nursed back to health by our seven garbage pail kids and this is the first time we really get a chance to see the garbage pale kids in the movie Uh uh-huh and what can we say here bo um (laughs) the animatronics on their faces Uh uh-huh the articulation is what you would expect to see at a chuck e cheese that's being closed down today if you've ever seen the goofy movie It's that roadside possum park that they stop at. It's that (laughs) level of bad. It's the thing of nightmares of how awful this looks. Not since the heyday of Hong Kong cinema have words not matched mouths so much. No. If I gave you just buckets of plaster of Paris, an unlimited supply of paints, you know, some chicken wire and pictures of these characters, you, loyal listener, could make a better looking garbage pail kid's head than what's featured in this movie. They look really, really bad. This is the prototype. All of them are the prototype. Like, somebody built it. They only made one, but they made one. And they were like, that's it. They didn't have no money for this. One and done. <laughs> and if it breaks, they, they, they said that they had to, like, fill in the gaps. Like, when they started moving the mouse, the heads broke. And they were just filling it in with glue and, and like, Alfredo sauce or something. It reminds me a lot of that first Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. That was good. That was Jim Henson people working on this. Yeah, this is the bad version of that. It, it It's just so crude and crappy. And I almost recommend, like, I certainly don't recommend watching this movie, but watching the the trailer watch the, tra- the trailer and you'll watch get the it. trailer or if you can find a clip of that god-awful song in the middle of the movie watch that because that is perfectly representative of everything terrible 
that is wrong with this film. So they're cleaning up Dodger and he's he hasn't really come to. So Wendy Winston wakes him up with just a huge fart to the face. Mm -hmm. Is this like smelling salts? Do his fart shit air stank so rotten that your body just violently comes to from smelling it? Right. It's smelling salts only. It's all colon based dodger isn't at all put off by the strangeness of these creatures he's just like hey who, who are you guys and they're by the way just rummaging through this shop like a bunch of gremlins set loose yeah alligator is even giving him some shit about like hey what about this stuffed alligator he's like what if i stuffed you manzini shows up right and all the garbage pail kids are like oh cat manzini and he's like, oh, dear boys, I've got to find a spell to put you back in the garbage pail. But unfortunately, I don't have the ingredients to do it. So I guess I'm going to have to work on a spell to get you all back in. And this is where we get sort of formal introductions of all these characters where Anthony Newley is introducing them to Dodger. We get to Nat Nerd, and this is the first time we get his shtick, which is as soon as he is presented to Dodger, he immediately pisses himself. It's shocking. Yeah. Hi, this is my friend Nat Puddle. Right. What, and what, what are you fucking doing? And you're then em you're <laughs> embarrassing yourself and you're embarrassing me. And then you get to Alligator, who is like, oh, look at this. I got a lunchbox full of fingers and toes, and here's an eyeball to eat. Can I nibble on your toes? Huh? huh? Where did these come from? Right. There's somebody walking around out there without eyes. I, let's assume, fingers crossed, that this hideous deformity is from a now corpse and not just somebody who's damaged. Who's cleaning up his piss? Does he clean it up? Do they just leave it? I mean, yeah. At one point, you actually see it. And he nearly grab a mop. What's the best piss your pants seen in a movie? Billy Madison? Maybe, maybe because that's a, actually a bonding moment. Dude! <laughs> Only the coolest kids pee their pants. Um, maybe. If pee in your pants makes you cool, and I'm Miles Davis. That is the grossest thing I've ever heard. Billy Madison holds up as good as any Adam Sandler movie. I don't disagree with that. Yeah, but then it's downhill from there. Maybe Teen Wolf, where the dad glows his eyes at the uh, the principal who pees himself and is like, I could always count on you. That's not a bad one. What about Steve Martin in Dirty Rotten Scoundrels? That may be my number one. That may be it. The, yeah, the thank you and then yeah. the look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another, you know, speaking of the cork on the fork a moment of like this joke sneaks up on you you know once he tilts his head and, and gets that look on his face you're like oh okay i see what's happening here uh that's quite good and the eye patch yeah, yeah it connects all the dots together yeah steve martin also pissed himself in grand canyon when he got shot in those white pants and he had yellow piss everywhere but that wasn't funny <laughs> no nothing about grand canyon was funny <laughs> or good dumb and dumber had a pretty good piss when they were riding on the motorcycle when he was like just go man just go and jeff daniels pissed all over jim carrey yeah that also has probably my favorite like i got a shit scene <laughs> with jeff daniels also yeah. him holding onto that toilet seat with his <laughs> legs extended out like if he's afraid he is going to be launched from that toilet <laughs> A move that our character Juice could have learned from had that film come out just a few years earlier. All right. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Captain Manzini says, uh, Dodger, we've got to find a way to put them back in the garbage pail. Even though that wasn't needed at the beginning of the movie when they clearly got out and ran around and then got back in the pail on their own. But details, details. But first, my young boy, hmm, I, it appears you need your nightly bath what how about you get naked in this 1800s era bathtub down in the basement surrounded by these three foot tall nightmares on legs while this old british guy looks on does dodger live with him like should we call the cops i don't think dodger has a home I think he spends his time divided between the antique store and staring into Tangerine's window. <laughs> Alligator does try to eat Dodger's toes. This is the first moment that we get that he's got a real thing for people's toes. I don't think it's a sex thing. It's just that's the part of the human body he wants to eat first. It's, it's not a Tarantino thing where he's like, listen, Dodger, I just have a question for you. Do you mind if I look at your toes? I just want to frame a shot with you in the bath and the toes front and center. Come on, piggies. Get moving. 
So the Garbage Pail Kids here, they're all extremely helpful in getting Dodger a towel and clothes for him to get dressed. And they're all being very complimentary to one another. And then Dodger puts on this clean outfit and he looks like a woman in her 70s headed to Vegas for the weekend. It is this sleeveless denim vest that is bedazzled and covered with stars and layered with animal prints. Like all he needs is one of those little tightly woven cowboy hats where the brim curls in and some big oversized sunglasses to complete the ensemble. It looks like something <laughs> Tootsie would have worn at the height of her popularity. It's pretty striking, this ensemble. Yeah. And this is where Anthony Newley is like, listen, all of you have to stay away from the normies. And Dodger's what? like, yeah, what are you talking about? <laughs> and, and Anthony Newley says, the normies, you know, normal people, people who aren't wizards, apparently, or garbage pail kids. Everyone in the world today is obsessed with their looks. You couldn't have come back at a worse time. Everyone is so obsessed with beauty and looks, unlike every other time in history. Which is such a backhanded, no, it's not even a backhanded compliment. It's a forehanded insult. He's saying you're ugly and people here are concerned with how they yeah, look. Yeah, right. Like you, you people are hideous. <laughs> and we're going to get in real trouble. Like, there's no way to fly under the radar looking as hideous as you do. And somehow or another, they know who Tangerine is? Well, Valerie Vomit asks Dodger. She says, hey, you want to suck face? And Dodger says, huh, not really. I like somebody else. Her name is Tangerine. She lives next door. And then the Garbage Pail Kids say, hey, we can help you get her. We're your pals now. And Dodger says, yeah. Maybe. You know what? Good night, Garbage Pail Kids. And he leaves and turns off the lights. Cut to Dodger, uh -huh. peering into the window of Tangerine, his favorite <laughs> hobby, <laughs> who lives literally next door to the antique shop. And Tangerine is just filling a duffel bag with clothes. At first, I thought she was robbing the place. But it turns out she's a fashion designer, as I mentioned earlier, because the movie forgot to. Mm -hmm. And it's daytime. And I was like, wait, it was night just before the edit. So is this the same day or the next day? Who cares? When she sees him, she invites him and then they get in the car and it turns night again. Like, like time has no meaning. Like they live on a planet where a day is eight minutes or something. <laughs> right. This is like Earth 473. Tangerine comes out of her apartment and she sees Dodger and she says, I'm sorry, Juice and his gang covered you in shit and piss, but I got to go. I'm taking this bag of clothes to the club to sell them. Hey, you want to come with me? And and Dodger says, do I? So he gets in this convertible to go to the club to sell clothes out of a duffel bag. That is her business plan, Chad. It is just to scavenge clothes or make some clothes and then sell them to people at nightclubs who I would like to point out are already dressed in clothes. Dude, when they arrive at this nightclub. And Tangerine just starts hustling out her random garments to a bunch of women that look like they would be more comfortable rifling through the clearance bin at a TJ Maxx. Mm -hmm. At one point, a woman is like, hey, I want that shirt you're wearing, Tangerine. So she just takes off her shirt and she's wearing a bra underneath. There's nothing overtly sexual about this, but Dodger has to sit down as all the blood from his body <laughs> is now filling his boner. He's like, Hachi Machi, whoa. Dude, he is so horned up for her. <laughs> then Juice and his pals roll by, and he just takes all of Tangerine's money. Where is this club, Bo? They get in the car, it's daytime. They drive, and now it is nighttime. Uh -huh. It's like something out of fear and loathing. If you want me to explain how the time works in this movie, you are sorely mistaken. Just I'm asking the universe because, again, there are so many little moments like this in this movie that you're just like, wait, what? How the what? And I'm not even talking about like, what's a garbage pail kid? How, like just basic storytelling is just like all the, the normal conventions of telling a story in a coherent fashion are just thrown to the wind. Win. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any fucking sense. It's like a Tim Burton movie. Only worse. <laughs> yeah. Is that possible? Yeah. yeah. Well, and because that at least has production design. Which, if you told me Tim Burton's Garbage Pail Kids movie, I'm not watching that, but it would be better than this. Oh, 100%. Tangerine gives all of her money to Juice. Because he's her pimp, right? Or something. And, and gets. And he's like, hey, get my convertible, baby. And she's like, you got it. Whatever you say. Sure. 
And then this whole time, Dodger, not wanting to get the shit kicked out of him again, he hides in her empty duffel bag. Uh And so our bad guys leave. Dodger emerges from the duffel bag. And then he's just like, well, I guess I'm just going to walk home. Like, this was a trip that they took in a car that took so long, day turned to night. Mm -hmm. Like, Dodger, you're going to get home by autumn? Yeah. I mean, again, all fine questions. Don't know. This movie doesn't bother (laughs) to give us any clues. Back at the antique store, the Garbage Pail Kids are going through trash cans outside or something, and they're looking for their friend's bow, and they're calling out names. Banana Anna, are you in here? Creepy Carol, where are you? I'm like, wait, there are others? What? Maybe that's their drive. They're looking for their friends. It's not. They never pay off any of this. So then the Garbage Pail Kids just decide to go get something to eat because apparently they need nourishment. And they steal a Pepsi delivery truck. Mm -hmm. And in the process of getting the keys, they pull them off the pants of the truck driver, but it's attached one of those long zip lines. And when they drive off in the truck, it rips off his pants, Mm -hmm. which I guess he's a stripper or something. And we see him wearing heart print boxers. That's a joke that never fails. That's an oldie, but uh, well, I was going to say goodie. What is the opposite of that? A garbage pail kid? Yeah, yeah. Only yeah. but a garbage pail. But then they almost they almost kill Juice. Yeah, they run over his car and it just squishes it like a pancake. Like this is all one great big cartoon, which would be fine if everything weren't so horny in this movie. Well, that's the only time they use cartoon physics in this film. They go to T-bone his van and as they drive past, like you said, it's just crushed like a pancake. Mm-hmm. And Juice isn't in it, which I was like, you know what? I would have loved... If they had killed Juice and then got arrested and the back half of the movie was just this like taut courtroom thriller, you know, like the bottom half of a law and order where Sam Waterston shows up to slur his speech in the courtroom. Is it, isn't it true that Greaser Greg, you, you wanted Juice dead. You wanted him dead so that you could have tangerine and all of that sweet Pepsi for yourself. Let me give you a counter offer. What if it becomes a shallow grave scenario where they're all turning on each other, uh, you know, uh, as they they try to figure out what they're going to do with the knowledge that they have murdered someone? I love it. Yeah. It's like from from dusk to dawn. The first half of the movie lures you in thinking it's one thing and then hard right hand turn. I like this. Again, pick six movies we make your movie less worse dude there are so many ways to make this movie less worse because everything about it is awful but well there, there's one i will give you a little bit later that i think is right. the, the way to fix this but anyway greaser greg and valerie vomit they're the ones who stole the truck and they return after committing grand theft auto uh, with this pepsi truck and as valerie vomit hops out of the cab of this truck she goes <laughs> we're the pepsi generation that's not a joke it's it's like a pop culture reference. It's fulfilling their obligation to Pepsi, who put up some money for this, clearly. You think so? I, it, they had to. I think Pepsi like threatened to sue them when it came out. Like, what? How dare you? There are only two companies <laughs> that put any money into this thing, and it was Pepsi and Tops. It, well, <laughs> Tops, sure, but... So they return, and they find the other Garbage Pail Kids outside cooking hot dogs or random roadkill over a trash can fire like a bunch of back alley hobos at a hooverville campsite and they just start eating literal garbage like Mm -hmm. food cooked over a fire from a burning metal drum which then leads to the garbage pail kids having like the equivalent of a hangover or as what most medical professionals would call it carcinogenic poisoning (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) uh for all this food and pepsi that they've yeah and burning trash cans they probably threw a bunch of tires in the bottom of it to really get the flames a going ironically they'll live longer than dodger after all that zoo water this movie is crazy bo for no good reason dodger is like oh you guys look like you had a rough night and they're like yeah but we also sewed a bunch of clothes for you to help woo this tangerine chick uh-huh. And yeah. we also made you this outfit, which in no way is a reference to any of the clothes that one Michael Jackson might wear. No, we, we, we thought it would look nice on a septuagenarian headed to a golden oldie singles bingo <laughs> night. 
or maybe on you. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's got tassels and stuff like he is some kind of, you know, the admiral of Fire Island. It does look, it does look like Michael Jackson's We Are the World jacket, but that also does not mean that it doesn't overlap the Venn diagram of things your Graham Graham should not wear out. It's so much Michael Jackson that when he dons this outfit in the next scene, he attempts to and fails to pull off the moonwalk. Yeah. As he's headed to where else, Bo? Tangerine's apartment to creep <laughs> sure. on her. Yeah. Yeah, of course. He, but this time, he just goes inside the apartment. You're absolutely no, right. No, no, like, no. He, hold on. He did, Juice is there. He peeks in the window, and Bo, he sees Juice, like, telling Tangerine, don't you talk back, you understand? And she's like, yes, sir. Call me doctor. 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 <laughs> and... <laughs> After he takes off, Dodger just walks into her place. There's no knock at the door. No. It's just, guess who's here? It's me, Dodger. She looks at him and she's like, oh my God, I love your clothes. I didn't know that you love to design fashion, you know, in clothes like that. I thought you liked girls. I mean, never mind. You know what? Go make me 12 more outfits in three days and then we'll go sell them at that nightclub next to the trash dumpster. Now get the hell out of here. I mean, make me some clothes. You creep. I mean... Look out for Juice. I'm worried about you. But seriously, get the hell out of here. Make me some new clothes. You're so handsome. Get out of here. Suddenly, Dodger is <laughs> there to make clothes for me. His jacket's a little funny, but he's only 14. To kind of get her way, she flashes him a little leg. And she's like, how many outfits do you think you can have for me by Friday? And he's like, uh, a million oh. And she's like, well, see what you can put together. <laughs> Thigh teen? I mean, uh, breast? Right. He's just a homina, homina, homina. <laughs> and, and he's like, so when can we see each other again? And she says, Friday, stupid, when we bring all the clothes. Did you catch when she sat down on this fainting couch? She did this PG version of the crotch shot from Basic Instinct. That's where she yeah. gives him the leg of, yeah, like. It, I don't think it's the leg. It was like. You know. The full money? You think? It was something. You know what they say if there's grass on the field, Dodger. Dodger immediately runs back over to the garbage trail kids. <laughs> hey, guys, I need 12 outfits in three days. You got to make it. <laughs> there's grass on the field. It's time to play. They're like, all right, get out of here, kids, so we can sing this horrible song about working with each other. Dude, this song is one of the worst examples of kids' movie music I've ever heard in my life. Now, look. I'm not wanting to besmirch the entertainment source from anyone's personal faith value system. Uh -huh. But it is a scientific fact that Christian-based entertainment is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> this movie feels like Christian-based entertainment absent scriptures and a moral. And a woman who just showed her JJ. <laughs> it's it really is in that neighborhood of shitty entertainment. And this musical number is like something that was rejected by a knockoff of Barney. It's so bad. Then at to the tune of this horrible song, they just go outside out, outside of the antique shop and start stealing all the stuff that they're gonna need to make all these clothes. They go to a place that has a sign up that says non-unionized sweatshop. Yes. And steal two sewing machines. Uh-huh. This yeah. movie is fucking crazy, bro. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? Like, it feels like it was written by a drug addict <laughs> for drugs. <laughs> and not a lot of drugs. Like it was like like you you want some you want some more heroin? Yes. Write me a garbage pale kids movie. Really? You're saying that this movie is the cinematic equivalent of selling a VCR? Because <laughs> I don't yes. disagree with that. Yes. Nothing fits together. It's just no one should ever see this movie. Like, I felt bad watching it. It made me sad inside to watch this movie twice. <laughs> yeah. It, but it's not nuts in the way that's like, oh, you should see this because of how crazy it is. It's nuts that anyone allowed this into a movie theater. It is nuts that no one sued, like an audience member didn't sue the makers of this movie for getting it somehow past whatever board decides what are movies and what are not. You know, 
I could see people giving this a positive review just because they love how fucking crazy it is. I mean, Bo, we're moments away from seeing Santa Claus and Abraham Lincoln in a jail cell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's about to happen. And, and, a, and a little person dressed as Charlie Chaplin. That's coming, people. Yeah. Okay, so... They start making these clothes. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, Nerdy Nat pees himself again, of course. Every time you see this guy, he's pissing himself. Dodger shows up the next day with a you know couple of bags of groceries and finds them all hard at work. And he's like, oh, this is this is great i can't believe that i'm gonna get all the, these clothes i'm probably gonna get it wet with tangerine now keep up the good work guys i'm gonna go next door and peek in her window and see if she's getting out of the shower again and they're like hey you watch out for that tangerine even though we've spent the entire movie trying to help you out with her but we also want to warn you that she could be trouble jake just showed up and slapped her around a little bit she's been crying all morning that's normally when she takes her bath and tries to use cold compresses to make the bruises not so noticeable it's so hot then <laughs> anthony newley shows up and is like to remind us he's in the movie you're like who oh yeah that guy's in here our our magical wizard or, yeah where he's like i you know i believe that the answer to our little problem here is a musical one i think i can invent a song because you know that is what i do that will allow us to suck all these garbage pail kids back into to the titular garbage pail and none of that happens bo you're right none you're of like, that happens what whatever like this is right up there with the hey we've got some friends we need to save somewhere then ned nerd between pissing himself he shows up and he's like hey guys i just found the television and they're like oh great maybe we can see our friends on tv but the tv doesn't work and it doesn't do anything like why even introduce this in the movie oh, the only thing it does chad is it inspires them to be like well i guess we should go to the movies instead but they dress up as perverts in trench coats with glasses and hats <laughs> yeah. like they're heading off to some 1970s era Times square jerk off theater and then ned nerd pisses himself before they leave yeah, yeah. somebody yeah, was like that's right all right guys everybody go to the bathroom before we leave for the movies two steps ahead of you when they go outside bo they magically have two miniature-sized ATVs that they all hop on to go to the movie theater. The Garbage Pail Kid Mobiles. Where the movie theater is showing a Three Stooges short. Dude, we see almost an entire Three Stooges <laughs> short in this movie. And it's one of those things where everybody in the theater is laughing way too hard to be watching the Three Stooges. Which generates a... <laughs> At best. And these people are knee slapping, guffawing their way all through right. this first three off, I imagine short. that they were all hi. <laughs> sure. Second off, it's a shimp, you know, but it is the Three Stooges short Malice in the Palace where the Stooges run a Middle Eastern restaurant where they make hot dogs and it's way less racist and offensive than that description implies. But it's a pretty funny short. <laughs> As Three Stooges shorts go, I know this one. <laughs> I used to watch a lot of Three Stooges on Sunday mornings before I unfortunately got dragged off to go to church. I was able to <laughs> skip out on both the Three Stooges and church, and I think I'm better for it. It was The Farm Report, Dennis the Menace, Three Stooges. Old black and white Jay North, Dennis the Menace. Which when you go back and watch those now, you're like, what a tortured, tortured soul. <laughs> what what a tragedy this is, really. I'd like to go back and watch that just to see if you can notice the moments where he's thinking about killing himself and killing others. While we're watching an entire episode of the Three Stooges in this movie, Alligator and Wendy Winston, they just decide to peel off and go rogue and head to a bar to get drunk. Yeah, yeah, that's right. They got, uh, they got uh, quite frankly, the better plan, if you ask me. But, and by the way, in a Muppets movie style fashion, the name of this bar is just the toughest bar in the world. So Alligator, he goes inside and starts looking for some toes to eat. And he chews the toe off of a male biker who's wearing sandals, which I don't think that's ever happened in the history of ever. And then a bar fight breaks out. Wendy Winston crashes his pint-sized four-wheeler through the front window. As this bar fight is, you know, taking place and everyone's punching each other, movie style, Um, Wendy Winston jumps up on the bar, bends over, and fart so violently that it blows the hat and mustache off of a bartender like it rips his facial hair off his face and before things can really get out <laughs> uh -huh. of control one of the bikers just goes hey man let's stop fighting let's all get drunk and that's what happens yeah it's like i really like the cut of these 
weirdos jibs. Then we cut back to the movie theater where Greaser Greg is literally stealing a hot dog from uh, one of the theater patrons it, at knife point. This movie is nuts, dude. And Messy Tessie sneezes into some popcorn, which blows it all over the hysterical yeah. crowd. And they're, they've got to be high. I mean, they are, they are literally slapping their knees at what's going on around them. Everybody gets back to the to the antique shop, and those seriously drunk bikers escort our two drunk garbage pail kids back, let's call it home. Yeah, drunk and on crank bikers, let's Dude, be clear. Then across the street, Juice, Blythe, and Wally, they're spying on the antique shop, you know, the way bad guys do. And they see the garbage pail kids going inside, and you're it's like... So what? <laughs> right, right. It's not like Harry and the Hendersons where there is a mystery of like, we need to prove that garbage pail kids exist. They're just hanging out of the rooftop across the street. I guess what? Trying to peek in on Tangerine. Maybe that's the thing. Maybe she's just this siren song that people like to scope her out. And then they got some garbage pail kids in their peripheral vision. Once they get back, Anthony Newley is like, you sons of bitches. I told you very clearly not to go outside because you're all horribly disgusting. Yeah, but I but I wanted to eat some toes. The fact that he makes Alligator swear not to go outside anymore and he says, I state your name. The fact that Alligator does not say, I state your name, was a stunner for me. I completely agree. He says, I, Alligator, swear not to go out and not to eat the people's toes. And then he walks off and over his shoulder he gives it a, you fucking idiot. I'm going to go, totally going to go eat toes. <laughs> yeah, he's like, why, why would you make... <laughs> A deal with a human alligator hybrid. That's crazy. Like, I got nothing to live for. Look at me. I'm a freak. I live by my own rules. Fucking Hawaiian print shirt. I got hair. It looks, looks like I stuck my finger in a electric socket. Every day I wish I was dead. I eat eyeballs. The next scene is Juice shitting on a toilet. And the movie cuts to the Garbage Pail Kids back down in the sewer where they crank up a valve that releases more piss and shit so violently that it explodes water up Juice's ass and elevates him <laughs> off the toilet to where he is holding his body against the ceiling, being propelled by, like, it's like a fire hose of shit and piss and toilet paper and filth. Then the movie heads over where Blythe and Wally, you know, our two heavies in the movie, they're just chilling mm -hmm. in a hot tub bow and the garbage pail kids crank up another valve that sends shit and piss into their hot tub. Mm -hmm. That happens in this movie. Yeah, that's all right. We're making this sound a lot better than it is. Right, right. Like, th we are having a better time talking about this as we normally do than it was to watch. It, watching this movie twice, in fact, is just unendurable. Anthony Newley then is Cap singing a Cap bunch Cap of Menzine. crackpot songs. Yeah. yeah. To, to try to get the kids back in the garbage pail. That's just to, again, remind the audience this is a thing that's happening. He's like, get, get in the, get back in the can, get back in the can. You can get monsters, go, mutt, cat, can, can. Winston was a boy who was kind of windy, but he knew his ass was... So, uh, uh, no, I telling, can't. telling the truth can be dangerous business. Honesty, popular, don't go hand in hand. Come with me and you'll be in a world of pure horrible... Uh, sir, sir, bakers. sir. Uh, we, yeah. uh, uh, we're the legal team uh, <laughs> from, from Warner Brothers. Uh, cease and desist singing that song, sir. Oh, yes, but I, I wrote the song. Doesn't matter, sir. You, you, you're plagiarizing yourself. You can do that. Damn it. I hate this so much. <laughs> all right. So Dodger is in the basement with all the garbage pail kids. You guys, you got to make more clothes. And they're like, we ain't going to make no more clothes for yous until you help us find our friends that are suddenly a thing in this Wait, movie. you got friends? There's more of you? Can they make clothes? Yeah, we think they're locked up in the state home for the ugly. And Dodger is like, wait a second. That doesn't sound like a real thing. Oh, Dodger, I'm sorry. It is a real thing. I should have mentioned it earlier in the movie, but um, it wasn't in the script and no one had ever mentioned it to me before. But it is a place. Maybe we should go find it now. So the next moment 
is we get a shot of this little girl wearing like one of those half old man masks that uh-huh. stops like at the cheeks and nose. It just covers like the top half of your head. Yep. And some dudes that look like park rangers throw an honest to goodness human sized butterfly net over this girl. Yeah. They're like cartoon dog catchers. And they're like, hey, you got to come with us. We're going to the state home for the uglies. And she takes off the mask and they're like, eh, hey, be more careful next time. We thought you was one of them uglies. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we thought you was subjectively unappealing. Anyway, get back to your frivolity and your childlike wonderment. And then Cap Manzini and Dodger, they show up and they see the truck that says on the side, state home for the ugly. They hop on the back like a couple of garbage men and they arrive at the state home for the ugly, which is clearly marked with giant letters on the outside, state home for the ugly. So they find this home, but that doesn't matter. Dodger heads back and he grabs his duffel bag filled with the clothes that the garbage bail kids made. Mm -hmm. He goes outside and sees Tangerine in her car and uh, he's like, hey, let's say we go find a dumpster and sell some clothes. And he like <laughs> he jumps and slides across the trunk of the Carl Dukes of Hazard style. And they go sell all these clothes and it's a real success. Bow. And then Tangerine, yeah. sh- they come back and Tangerine leans in and kisses him on the cheek. She, he's, he's like, boing, 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 boing. he's like, oh, my notes were after she kisses him on the on the cheek, he Definitely has a boner. He he just it has like spontaneous orgasm in his pants. And then Tangerine just walks across the street and gives all of her money to Juice. What's going on here? Don't even worry about it because it's never really addressed why she's handing all her money over. And then all the Garbage Pail Kids come out on the street and Tangerine sees them with Dodger. And Tangerine's like, Jesus Christ, what the <laughs> hell are these things? These are my friends. Yeah, and they made all of the clothes. Not me. I'm a liar. Tangerine then proposes the the third act of the movie, essentially, we're which so, is... We're so close to this being over. Yeah, she's like, hey, how about you get all your little freak friends to make a whole bunch more clothes, and then I'll put on a fashion show under my name. I mean, you don't have your own label or nothing, do you? And he's like, well, no, I'm not even sure what that is. She's like, great. Well, <laughs> you little freaks make this all happen with the designing and sewing, and I promise it, then I'm going to keep this Garbage Pail Kid situation a secret, and I'll even cross my heart. And so she kind of fingers her tit <laughs> as she's crossing her heart, and then puts that finger on his lips. And this is the point where he shoots. <laughs> like, he is a mess. And then she leaves him to walk back over to Juice and plants a kiss on him. Yeah. Like, she's really getting this both ways. She's a real mess. We cut to the Garbage Bill kids in the basement playing poker, and they're all cheating, or possibly they just don't know the rules of poker. And the Garbage Bill kids say, hey, we're not making any more clothes for Dodger until he helps us find our friends. And then Dodger's like, oh, did I forgot to mention we found the state home for the ugly. You guys keep making some clothes. And we cut to <laughs> Cat Manzini and Dodger sneaking into the state home for the ugly. But then that goes nowhere. Right. And then we get a montage of the Garbage Pail Kids making more clothes. Tangerine shows up and calls the Garbage Pail Kids like ugly turds. And she's just genuinely being a terrible person. And she caps off like the scene by collecting all of the clothes and telling Dodger that she's like, you know, I'm going to give a little bit of the nooka nooka to you after the fashion show if you're good. And he's just like, yes, ma'am. And then the Garbage Pail Kids all say like, hey, can we go to the fashion show too to see people wearing our beautiful garments? And she's like, no, uses a bunch of ugly pieces of shit. Stay here. And they're like, oh, this is, <laughs> right. this is terrible. And then one of them's like, I got a great idea, guys. I know how we can make it to the fashion show. What is it, Garbage Pail Kid? random character what if we all dress up as circus clowns and go to the fashion show what in the hell is happening in our movie Bo? dude my favorite thing is after this is proposed dodger is like oh yeah that sounds like a pretty good idea and it goes out to tell tangerine this scheme like hey i was talking to all the other garbage pail kids <laughs> they said they're just gonna dress up as clouds and she was like Absolutely not. G- 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 no. Give me, give me that giant lock. I'm locking him in the fucking basement. All right. Right. It puts the, the like, locks the door and puts the key for it yeah. in her bra. Yeah. On, on top of her tit. Yeah. Oh, God. 
oh yeah, that's locked. That's locked. All right. And then obviously the garbage bell kids are all pissed off about this. Yeah, they walk up the stairs and like thunka thunka thunka. Like, hey, what what the fuck is this? Dressed as clowns, by the way. They are ready to go to execute their their clown plan. What's this say on the back of the door? Triangle shirtwaist. Oh fuck. <laughs> and so Tangerine tells Dodger. <laughs> Like, they pull up to this fashion show or whatever. Basically, it's a motel. And it's like, hey, why don't you take all these clothes inside and then blow some a kiss? He runs in with two duffel bags of clothes for this fashion show. I mean, it looks like he's off to make a Craigslist transaction in an Arby's parking lot. Dude, it looks like he's going to rob the bank with the Joker (laughs) at the beginning of the Dark Knight. <laughs> and so the garbage pail qu- kids quick to adapt are just goofing off downstairs well if we can't go to the fashion show why don't we just you know play poker and fart on each other <laughs> like snot on each other <laughs> right right like act like 10 year olds <laughs> you and- piss in the corner too late piss in the corner again too late and anthony newley is upstairs trying to get the music right for a spell and he's like by jove i think i've got it but just as he in the can get back get back in the can candy man makes sir sir we're not gonna warn you again so (laughs) juice and his goons show up and they tase him or something they spray him in the face with something and just knock him out i don't know what yeah. it is so they open up the door to this downstairs where they can see all the garbage pail kids doing their garbage pail kid shtick and as they come up apparently they shop at the same place as the state home for the ugly because they've got their own net to throw on the garbage pail kids yeah before we finish that storyline, we cut to Tangerine, who's micromanaging the shit out of this fashion show. Yeah, she's being a real Which is demon. being held at one of your finer sound stages. Dodger shows up dressed in this tuxedo with a bunch of sparkly lapels and this sequined bow tie and a oh shirt God. underneath that I will bet $1,000 did not have sleeves. Dodger looks like he's dressed up as Bob Fosse for your favorite director day at a local school for the arts. Hold on, I got a joke. Give me two seconds. <laughs> Dodger looks like he's trying out for the Junior Chippendales dance team. Yeah, I'm, give me two seconds. I'm almost there with the joke. <laughs> Dude, it is the tuxedo that would be worn by Tom Villard on the show We Got It Made. <laughs> <laughs> that that joke is for one person and one person only. <laughs> hey, look at this tuxedo that I got. We cut back to the state home for the ugly, where Juice, Wally, and Blythe have dropped off the garbage pail kids. And we go inside this place where there are these holding cells on a wall that are marked with labels on the front to explain what the person inside is being held for. So there is one that says this person is too old. One is too bald. One is too weird. The too bald guy is Gandhi. And -hmm. the too weird guy is just some dude with a mustache wearing a tutu. The one that really took me back Uh is the too crippled. Oh my God. That was the best one. I was like, Oh my God. God. Yeah, the dude was kind of like, like, kind of contorted up, like a, a a low rent elephant man. Santa Claus is in one cell, and it says too fat. Abe Lincoln is too thin. There's a clown that's too silly. None of these people are ugly. And then they lock all the garbage pail kids in a cage marked too gross. And then the garbage pail kids realize they're like, hey, none of our missing friends are here. And surprises of surprise, Bo, Ned Nerd pisses his pants again. <laughs> what that's not the ned nerd i know and one of so one of the guards when you know all the kids are locked away one of the guards is like don't worry they'll be gone soon enough squish and he makes hand motions like they're going to be crushed to death yeah in some kind of garbage compactor they round up the undesirables Bo, and exterminate them and i was like hey man has anybody read art spiegelman's mouse let me ask you a question. Is that what happened to the friends that are never found? Is, are we that, just to assume that I they were Cap murdered? Manzini says that a little later. He's like, like uh, Dodger's like, the friends aren't in. There's like, sorry, old chum. They got the old squish squish. 
I think that they killed all their friends. I think that's what happens. It's so, implied. but does that make Anthony Newley, Captain Manzini, a monster for not having search for him? Because earlier he was like, I didn't want to believe the place was real. So, you know what? I just didn't bother to look. You know what? Sometimes you just got to look the other way. <laughs> I guess so. So, <laughs> anyway, speaking of Captain Manzini, he finally wakes up after being gassed or whatever to find that all of the garbage pail kids are gone. Finally, my problem is solved. Now I can write. <laughs> sequel to to one of my wonderful hits and juice and the goons show up at the fashion show where finally tangerine is kind of showing her true colors with dodger there's a point where it feels like she should make a face turn here where she understands like oh what i've been doing is terrible and beauty is only skin deep and no 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 juice no, no, no. that never happens chad no she plays everybody against everybody until the very end of the movie when she just quits being in the movie yeah and i mean even then tries to like lie and on top of lie to get her, her herself out of that mess but anyway we'll cut back to the fashion show proper here in just a second yeah because what happens is captain manzini goes to the state home for the ugly and is immediately thrown out as we pointed out earlier there's a storm brewing in this scene for no good reason yeah wally and blythe grab dodger and throw him in a dumpster and then dodger immediately escapes in his little mm-hmm. sparkly tuxedo jacket and his bow tie and he heads to the state home for the ugly here captain manzini is waiting as dodger arrives as lightning and thunder explodes in the background and then we go back to the fashion show that just looks terrible it looks like something taking place in a church basement and there's maybe a hundred <laughs> yeah. people there clapping their hands like idiots it looks like one of your finer underage beauty pageants one of those creepy like hey we're gonna put five-year-olds and bathing suits and put vaseline on their teeth it's that kind of crowd i half expected to see like uh david byrne and john goodman you know off to the side every dream <laughs> dude end. if it cut to him in a david byrne in a like story. cadillac convertible boy that tangerine <laughs> Who you she are. sure does like clothes all right you're the dream operator take it up dreams that, now that's all I want to see is that true story of, you know, uh, John Goodman being uh, his dream being to be a judge of a fashion show. And this is the big, like, culminating <laughs> end of the movie. Boy, everybody sure got what they wanted. I guess it's time for another song. I've seen that no less than 12 times in my life. Like, I've True seen- Stories is a great movie. I want to go watch that now. Say what you will about the weirdness of David Byrne. I will say nothing about the weirdness of David Byrne. He's fantastically weird. I don't disagree by any stretch. Uh, Like, I look, that Stop Making Sense concert that Jonathan Demme did is one of the great concerts of all time. But, you know, just if he showed up in this movie and we just cut over to, like, Papa Legba, I would be like, you know what? This movie's all right. <laughs> Did you watch that John Mulaney special on Netflix called The Lunch Bunch Kids? I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where he showed up. And uh-huh. Was, what is David Byrne doing here? And how is this not more widely publicized? I know. I know. Like, if David Byrne was just like, all right, everybody, it's time to go to our fashion show. <laughs> it's a wild, wild life. I bet you got some garbage pail kids that you know. I was like, wow. Yeah, I'd be like, this is one of the great movies of all time. How has this been so maligned? <laughs> I think that whole conversation was for that same one person. <laughs> Earlier. Garbage pail kids for sale. <laughs> <laughs> all right so where are we right. we're so close to the end of this yeah so, yeah, yeah so um, yeah uh, so this is where kept manzini is breaking into the state home uh for the ugly and then, well, and then dodger somehow knows about the biker bar and heard about the adventures earlier even though he wasn't involved in this at all <laughs> he runs into the biker bar and he's like hey guys the little fellas are in trouble i need your help and all of these drunken bikers are like hell yeah let's go <laughs> right let's go fuck it up and, and do you think you could do that in most like like cd bars just runs like like hey 
I need somebody's help to go fuck somebody up. Like, all right, let's go. All right. I'll tell you what, I'm going to take a hit of this speed, and then I'm good to go, brother. Grab your pool cues. Grab your bicycle chains. Don't you want to know who it once more onto the breach? So, <laughs> Cat Mancini busts into the state home for the ugly joint and is immediately accosted by a, a guard. And this is where he uses some, in quotes, magic, where he just, like, throw some flash powder into the air which distracts the guard long enough for him to just beat the shit out of him but hold on i thought you were gonna say like he used some of his like merlin magic this is like the shit you buy down at your local <laughs> yeah. novelty trick shop the fact that he didn't use itch powder like it could have happened either way they're like oh geez it's a it feels like this bug's all over me the wand that becomes the flowers <laughs> <laughs> oh and then just kick <laughs> <You know? laughs> he does that and then pulls out a gun and puts two in his head <laughs> yeah yeah we call that the copperfield double tap <laughs> one hand full of handkerchiefs the other a 45 <laughs> all right so Basically, they set everybody free from the state home of the uglies, including including uh, Santa Claus, Santa Claus, Abraham Lincoln, Gandhi, the clown, the guy in the tutu, and of course the cripple. Here we do get the bonus person we missed earlier, uh, who was marked as too short, and it's a little person dressed up as Charlie Chaplin for some reason. Uh, um, yeah. The bikers help to rip off the bars on a window that really look like a slight tug could have achieved the same outcome. And everybody yeah, yeah, yeah. just kind of runs off into the night air as lightning and thunder fills the sky. <laughs> and then Dodger and Cap Manzini decide to head to the fashion show to wrap up our movie. Just to put a finer point on this, the reason they go is because all the garbage bail kids are like, hey, we wants to go to the fashion show and fuck shit up. <laughs> and <laughs> and Cap Manzini is like, well, why stop now, I guess? Yeah. And that's it. And that the whole plan is just to go screw with them. So we cut to the fashion show. While we're there, this is where Juice is on a payphone, and we hear him say, yeah, as soon as the stuff gets across the border, get it to the warehouse. And I was like, what is he? Is he talking about drugs or prostitutes? What is what is Juice doing? And then out of the nowhere, Greaser Greg, or a puppet of Greaser Greg, is attached to a rope, and then, you know, some stagehand pushes it in front of the camera and it crashes into Wally and knocks him down. And then simultaneously a fire extinguisher dislodges off the wall and bonks a juice on the head. That's right. Then the garbage pail kids just create some chaos by pushing clothing racks onto the catwalk. And here for the first time, regular people in masks or the normies, as they call them, they see the garbage pail kids and everybody freaks out. Then the garbage pail kids just start ripping clothes off the models. Oh, my God. And dude. the models run around in their underwear. Who is this for <laughs> other than perverts who like to look through their the window at underage girls and see people like forcibly stripped of clothing? I don't know. And, and lots of farting. And vomiting and pissing. Yeah. And shitting on your mouth. It is very deviant. Juice comes to, he grabs a piece of wood to just go beat the shit out of somebody. It's total chaos. The Garbage Pail Kids and models in their underwear are running around. Dodger and Cap Manzini, they finally show up on the scene. Wendy Winston comes out on the catwalk, bends over, and just rips a huge fart, emptying the room of attendees. Wally punches vomit valerie but that's mm -hmm. after vomit valerie says go ahead make my day again most of what she says are just sort of what advertising slogans and catchphrases from other characters after wally punches her he goes down for the count and he's there with Blythe. and then this is the one and only time that valerie vomit just unloads and just covers these two with gallons and gallons of vomit Yes. And then, Bo, we get my favorite part of the whole movie. The the big fight scene? I, if I could show only one scene in this movie, it's right here. It's where Dodger, this 14-year-old kid, decides to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Juice, who easily has 12 inches on this kid. 
and he's 10 years older. Yeah, it's a real Rocky versus Ivan Drago. Bo, when these two fight, and by these two, I mean Juice and the stuntman for Mackenzie Aston, it's fantastic. The stunt work in this is so shockingly bad. Like, when the, <laughs> it looks like it's intentionally bad. To where when they're fighting, like, it's not the same person. He is clearly a foot taller than the kid playing him. It's a lot like when they used to do their stuntmen for Shatner on Star Trek. Where it's like, oh, that ain't him. It, it's that caliber of stand-in. But also, you've already got all the little people in Hollywood shoved into these Garbage Pail Kid costumes. That's who you needed for the stunt person. Yeah. The fight ends with Dodger ultimately getting the upper hand on Juice. And then he's on he's sitting on top of Juice, just turning his face into a hamburger, punching him over and over. And it's a real Ralphie from A Christmas Story. And like Dodger just starts crying as he continues to just punch this guy's face inside out and captain manzini comes over and he's like leave him alone boy he's he's already dead <laughs> it is like he just loses his mind it's like walking in the deer hunter for a second yeah i mean he's beating the shit out of this guy and won't let it go yeah so, tangerine shows up at the antique shop because that's where our movie uh ultimately ends and dodger's there and he's all pissed off and dodger says you know tangerine i don't think you're pretty anymore and and he says all this while he's wearing that sparkly bow tie and his little fancy tuxedo jacket but she's like hey how about we just be friends or something and you can keep making them clothes for me i'm gonna go to hollywood and maybe new york and we can just hang out sometimes and it doesn't have to be all romantical uh, beat it sister <laughs> <laughs> and then she is gone from the movie never having learned a lesson or anything no inside the and antique store cap manzini says everyone ever i've i've created a musical spell that'll send everyone back to the trash can um even though that wasn't needed at the start of the movie all right everyone everyone close your eyes i'm going to sing this magical spell song and he's like he's like get back in the can in the garbage pail kids and while everyone has their eyes closed the garbage pail kids just decide to fuck off and they walk out the front door. Yeah, they just leave. And then Cat Mancini's ass gets sucked into the trash can for a minute. And then, they, you know, Dodger helps yank him out. Yeah. And then they're like, they didn't actually go in the trash can, did they? Oh, well, what are you going to do? And that's it. <laughs> and then the Garbage Pail Kids get on their miniature four-wheelers and just drive off into the night to terrorize more people. The end. All right, so Chad, I've got my how to make this movie less worse. Oh my God, there's a million ways, but please. Sure, but here's what I think they kind of tiptoed around based on what we've seen. This isn't just whole cloth, new new story. You get rid of Tangerine, all the fashion show crap. Okay. And you do the stay home for the ugly. Like you can make that a little sillier, which this whole movie needed to just be a whole lot sillier and a lot less horny. Sure. You have them searching for their lost friends. Okay. And that's the adventure, right? It's like, hey, we're going to break into this place. You can have them get caught. And they all got to bust out. And at the end of the movie, they're all brought together. And they just cause mayhem. And like it, it's just a big Warner Brothers cartoon. Sure. And along the way that you teach a lesson, like you can still have Dodger and maybe, you know, his girlfriend or something or a, a love interest. And she learns a lesson about like, oh, even though they're disgusting and farting and pissing and everything, they they have good hearts and are trying to help or whatever. But you just don't need all the TNA for this, you know, movie geared at kids and also the goons that are threatening to traffic people or drugs. I mean, like all of this extraneous stuff takes away from what should be the focus, which is the garbage pail kids who really are kind of a side note to the movie. I completely agree. Hell, if you want to kick it off, have something from space, crash on Earth, have the kid find it or whatever else, and he throws it in a trash can, and then the trash can gets full of, like, a snot rag and, you know, the stuffed alligator, and somebody throws up in it, and then that's what makes your garbage bell kids. Yeah. Fine. And, the, and yeah. then they come out and they're like, oh, we're misfits, we're whatever else. You know, even though we're all misfits, some of us got caught. We got to go save them because, you know, misfits stick together and... You know, we can do anything and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It, You're right. Goonies never say die. Yeah. It's that kind of thing. It, it, you know, and I know what's coming over the next 
five episodes. We've already this season is is locked and loaded, and it's it's not it's not getting much better. And arguably, it may be getting worse. It's hard to imagine. I, I, I know, mean, really. Which leads us to uh, episode two, <laughs> the season's pop culture club. Bo, what do you have teed up for us? Hey there, jerky. How about some prank phone calls? Prank phone calls are funny. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be funny to make a movie about prank phone calls? <laughs> Sizzle chest. My name's Frank Rizzo. Oh my god. It's, it's, yeah. it's all frozen first. For those of you who do not remember what came before Crank Yankers. Yep. What came before that was, in fact, a movie, uh, or actually a, a, a album, CDs, a phenomenon, and, uh, called The Jerky Boys. Yeah. And if you really want to have a good time, Chad, yes. check out an interview with Tom Jones, who is in the Jerky Boys movie. I did not know that because I've never seen it, but go on. And they're interviewing him about the Jerky Boys and his part in the Jerky Boys movie. And Tom Jones is trying to diplomatically say like, oh yeah, I know who these people are and I listen to them all the time. And my friends come over and I play it for them and they laugh like hell. And is that enough? Can I go now? I'm <laughs> Tom Jones, after all. I have to get back to having middle-aged women throw me their underwear. But yeah, so we're, we are doing the Jerky Boys movie. It's funny because on the, the Legion Podcast Discord, when we announced the season, somebody actually said, are you guys doing the Jerky Boys movie for this? And I was happy to tell them, yes, yes, we are. Your All your dreams are coming true, listeners. <laughs> the Jerky Boys were huge. You know, I don't know if they were bigger than garbage pill kids but they were big i remember yeah. going past music stores and them having full window displays of their cds coming out for that jerky mm-hmm. boys 3 cd when it came out it was huge yeah i mean it was a legitimate phenomenon like the, like the the guy who does all the frank rizzo voices john brennan i think is his name uh-huh. um has pivoted that into an honest to goodness career yeah i mean shit they made a movie out of it and we're gonna talk about it in two weeks time so there you go there you have it the right. jerky boys movie up next all right well as always like rate review send us an email at pick six movies at gmail.com um if you got comments thoughts questions you know where to find us we're around we're having a good time we're trying to live our lives just like you uh, share the podcast with a friend or don't do whatever the hell you want we're just here to try to make you laugh and have a good time while you're You know, commuting to work or doing the dishes or walking the dog or just sitting quietly in your home doing nothing. That's what we're here for. So thank you for listening. Bo, any final thoughts that you have on the Garbage Pail Kids movie? Oh, God. We can do anything if we work together. (laughs) I just pissed myself. Oh, stop it. I pissed myself again. Smells like somebody's been eating asparagus. Oh, more piss. We'll see you in two weeks' time, everybody. (laughs) Ha, 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 ha.